Welcome back to Combat Mission Fortress Italy, where we're in uncharted territory. Historically speaking, the German thrust into the American beachhead at Salerno failed in the last mission. Now that we're over the Chloe River, we're taking a hypothetical swing to the west to get on the road to our ultimate objective, Ponte Berizzo, and the bridges over the river separating the Allied beachhead. Before we can get there though, we've got another chunk of American defenders to overcome. These are likely to be the same kind of scattered remnants and hurriedly deployed miscellaneous troops as in the last mission, and again, they're likely to be supported by copious amounts of off-map artillery and armoured reinforcements from the beachhead itself. This could make things interesting, because the mission here is similar to the first battle of the campaign. I've got to touch four objectives and then exit my force off the map edge. I have more time, a whole hour, and the map is at first glance the same kind of open farmland studied with orchards and woods that makes good tank country, but the prospect of coming up against better anti-tank opposition in the form of M10s and potentially Shermans is not encouraging. Also not encouraging is the ground itself when subject to closer inspection. There are several irrigation ditches and canals on the map, one of which forms a vehicle impassable obstacle on a line from my right to the centre, and the highway running across the entire map is on a raised embankment, providing enemy tanks with disturbing hull-down opportunities. This does feed into developing a course of action though. The area around the Route 3 objective seems likely to be the cornerstone of the American defence. There is plenty of concealment, one side is covered by the impassable ditch, and the front of the position can be covered from the highway embankment. Bypassing this area doesn't seem like a reasonable proposition. My vehicles can't go around to the right, and going around to the left takes me to confined space on the far side of the highway with an exposed flank. In other words, I'm feeling the need to smash this area. I've got the artillery to do it as well. The 105mm Wests in the last mission were very effective. I have those two batteries again, plus a two-gun section of 150mm self-propelled guns as well. These are going to hammer a line through the orchards on the Route 3 objective, supported by one of the 105 batteries hitting the woods on the edge of the canal beneath, and the other targeting enfilade positions on the embankment. Under cover of that bombardment, I should be able to move up. I have my whole force available here, though some elements are arriving as reinforcements in a few minutes, so I have plenty of firepower. Using my tanks to provide support from the front via the Route 2 objective, I should be able to follow up the bombardment with an infantry attack from the flank to roll that first possession up from the right. At the same time, under cover of the artillery, I can hopefully get away with hooking a tank platoon out onto my far left and getting up to the embankment. From there, they should be in the position to provide long range support to the attack on Route 3 without too much risk from potential 37mm AT guns in the centre, whilst still being able to pop up over the slope and either enfilade defenders on the other side or with any luck, engage American armoured reinforcements coming in from the right map edge from hull down positions. Naturally it's unlikely to pan out that cleanly, but dominating the far side of the highway with fire and concentrating my force against the objectives on the south side, rolling up routes 2, 3 and 4 before punching for the exit, seems like a reasonable plan. I certainly look to have enough time, but I also want to move fast. In the last mission I was very much pushed for time at the end and had to take some serious gambles to try and get things done that resulted in potentially needless casualties. It may well be better to take some early risks to seize a better immediate position than have to scramble recklessly as the clock runs down. Edging forward under cover of the bombardment quickly reveals three initial sources of American resistance. A pair of priests in the central orchard, at least one AT gun up on the highway on the left, and some infantry in Objective 2. These are all areas that I am conspicuously not hammering with artillery at the start. The priests manage to get some shots out, though luckily for one of my Panzer fours, it looks as though they've used up their heat ammunition before getting the range. The rearmost priest is quickly taken out by my tanks moving up on the left, but ultimately I'm more worried about the anti-tank gun. This resolves into a 57mm gun, the American designation for the British 6 pounder, and it's a much more dangerous opponent for my Panzer 3s and 4s than the 37mm guns encountered thus far in the campaign. 
Luckily, if you can call it luck, it starts engaging at about 800 meters, where its post-penetration effects are more muted, and while it hits one of the Panzer threes twice, it only manages to inflict some light damage. It's actually a relatively hard target up on the highway embankment, being roughly at the same height as most of my tanks means that their shells are coming in at a flat trajectory and really need to score a direct hit to achieve anything. It's a perfect mortar target, but while I have both of my mortar carriers, I used up almost all of their ammunition getting across the river in the last mission, so they're not a lot of help. What I do have though is a lot of armour focusing on a single target, and eventually, inevitably, that direct hit happens and knocks the 57mm out. The American infantry on Objective 2 present a different tactical problem. They're occupying what looks like a little farm compound. There's a farmhouse, a small orchard, some outbuildings, and, the biggest pain, a high perimeter wall. This is a little knot of dense terrain in the middle of a mostly open flank, and I'm inevitably going to have to get some infantry in there to clear it the hard way. But I'm also not keen on risking my slowly dwindling manpower without giving the compound a good going over first. That's the job I gave to my surviving stomach. While it did a good job of knocking a hole in the wall, I am absolutely not going all the way around to the other side of the compound to use the front gate. Moving it up brought it into line with the sight of the surviving priest with fatal consequences. By now, however, my first batch of reinforcements have arrived and with it a platoon of AA vehicles. These mount quad 20mm cannons and I soon have two of them ripping into the compound, tearing down the outbuildings and blowing in the top floor of the farmhouse. Before I'm happy enough to try and storm the place, I have to confront a much more serious problem. Since the game started, American trucks have been continuing to try and use the highway, moving down the road from right to left. It's not a good move, but that just plays into the way it doesn't seem very tactical. This is still the American beachhead, and it's entirely possible that these trucks full of GIs are just transiting as if they either weren't expecting there to be a company of German tanks watching them, or because somebody didn't tell them about it. Either way, they're easy prey, and soon the highway is littered with burning trucks and dead GIs. After about 10 minutes though, it looks like some Shermans start to follow them. It's easy to write the humble Sherman off if you're used to squaring off against them with Panthers or Tigers. In 1943, with Panzer III's and Panzer IV's, they are a much, much tougher prospect. But, in Echoes of the Last Mission, I'm able to catch them flat-footed. At a technical level, things might be about even, but tactically, tank combat usually comes down to who gets the first shot off. The Shermans look to be splitting into two groups, one proceeding down the highway following the trucks, and the other splitting off to reinforce the US positions in the centre. I've been leapfrogging my panzers forward, and it's easy enough to put the brakes on and assume a stationary position, allowing the Shermans to roll into their gun sights. This is not a fair fight. Between them, the Shermans get a single shot off, and while I'm lucky that it hits the ground underneath Panzer IV instead of being on target, I have upwards of 15 tanks online, and the Americans conveniently present themselves in ones and twos. The Panzers not only knock them all out piecemeal, but stray into overkill as each Sherman suffers multiple hits. Just like that, the threat evaporates. I've managed to get a Panzer IV up to the line of the highway too, in a good enfilade position for what at this stage is even more overkill, but this doesn't last. Just after I've brought another up to join it, it takes a penetration to the front turret and the crew bail out. The tank behind it suffers the same fate in the next turn and brews up. Neither of them saw anything. It turns out at the end of the game that the culprits are a Sherman on the highway and an M10 tank destroyer up near the top right map edge, firing at a range of about 1300 meters. This is worth noting because, just like some of the previously engaged Shermans, both of the destroyed Panzer IVs were hull down. Hull down positions are important, but they don't make vehicles harder to kill. Modern weapons are accurate enough to successfully engage very small targets. Instead, Hold down positions make vehicles harder to spot. Driving up to a position with a huge dust cloud and firing a few shots does a lot to nullify that advantage. It looks like going any further beyond the highway would be a bad move. This does feel like the turning point of the game though. 
destroying or severely degrading the enemy's anti-tank assets is always a key moment, but I've also secured the Route 2 objective by storming the farmhouse. And now that the bombardment of the centre position has tailed off, I'm pushing a Panzer Grenadier platoon towards Route 3 from the flank. They have to punch across one of the irrigation ditches, so it's not easy going, but while the GIs in front of them offer some resistance, they also quickly crumble thanks to the support of several Panzer 3Ns and half-tracks on the other bank. They can't cross, but they can certainly contribute. The fighting does reveal more American vehicles further back though, another section of priests with their HQ and support half-tracks strung out between the exit village and the Route 4 objective pushing some Panzer 3s across the bridge directly at the centre position to get the right angle going reveals something else too. The second Panzer 3 is destroyed halfway across the bridge by what turns out to be another M10. This is a massive pain. That wreck has blocked the bridge completely, meaning I can only push vehicles through the irrigation ditches nearby to advance on that axis with much increased risk of bogging down. To add insult to injury, the first Panzer III also suffers the same fate. I do have a fix up my sleeve though. The Stug trio from the last mission has arrived with my final wave of reinforcements and I send them off to the right. Two of them hook round into an orchard in the far corner where they can see down the map edge. Again, it's risky sending them in unsupported, but I need the speed and it pays off. One of the Stugs quickly takes the M10 out with a shot to the turret. This does a good job of opening the center, where the American infantry are finally giving way en masse under fire from the Panzers and pressure from the advancing Panzer Grenadier platoon. It's certainly not all one way though. The American artillery is very much in evidence and while I'm mostly able to stay ahead of it, a 105mm barrage catches the ever unlucky Pioneer platoon as it waits by the Objective 2 compound. Both the surviving Pioneer half-tracks are destroyed by near misses along with another half-track that suffers a direct hit. By the end of the fire mission, the entire Pioneer platoon can fit inside the platoon commander's Kubelwagen. They've basically been wiped out. The crunch point of the game is definitely over though. With the Panzers overrunning the centre position, the American infantry fleeing for their lives, and the remaining Allied vehicles being steadily mopped up, this battle is starting to turn into a huge exercise in traffic management. With the right flank impassable to vehicles and forcing the left flank or the highway route not a tactical problem I'm willing to try and solve, everything has to pass through the centre, over the ditches, through or around the auctions and across the fields to the exit. And once again, I need to work at pace. With only 20 minutes left, my leading elements might have an easy 500 metres to go, but I'm spread out all over the map, and for other elements the distance might be more than 1500. It's a long way moving cross country with accumulating track or wheel damage from hitting fences or walls. It's even further when it involves going through some narrow, easily congested bottlenecks with the threat of effective enemy artillery fire lurking overhead. Breaking off a small group to clear out the Route 4 objective, a little open farm compound, the end game degenerates into something approaching Mad Max as the constituent streams of my force dash for the exit zone. The battle peters out, ending after I've exited almost my entire force, having touched and cleared three of the four route objectives. The result is a minor victory, which I'm entirely happy with, as the end screen reveals significant numbers of American troops dug in around the untouched Route 1 objective. It looks as though the risk of concentrating on the centre paid off. Thanks to the highway embankment, none of those troops were able to participate in the main body of the battle. Overall, I've lost 36 dead and 25 wounded, mostly to enemy artillery fire, plus the two Panzer IVs on the highway, the two Panzer III Ns near the bridge in the centre, and four half-tracks. I've also got a handful of troops scattered across the map, who I either didn't have the transport capacity or time to bring out, and a single Panzer IV immobilised in a ditch. The Americans, on the other hand, have lost 212 dead and 83 wounded, had 8 men taken prisoner, and lost a total of 11 tanks, 9 other armoured vehicles, and 11 light vehicles like jeeps and trucks. But these losses don't count for anything in the long run of the campaign, while mine do. Next up we have the final mission at Ponte Barizzo, where I'm going to have to go for broke. Hope you all enjoyed this video, it was a big complex battle, and I'll see you in the next one.